NIPPV for Sleep Dysregulated Breathing in Sleep Apnea by Dr. Umakant Katwa. Hello, everybody. My name is Umakant Katwa. I'm a pediatric pulmonary and sleep specialist at Boston Children's Hospital. Today, I will be speaking on use of non-invasive positive pressure ventilation for <clears throat> treatment of sleep apnea and dysregulated breathing in children. So in my talk today, I'm going to begin with some basic physiological aspects of sleep and respiration. I'm going to discuss a little bit about non-invasive positive pressure ventilation delivery devices. And then we're going to talk about some basics of CPAP therapy and bilevel therapy in children. Physiologic effects of sleep. So first, let me start with the impact of sleep on breathing. So what happens to the breathing when one sleeps? To understand that, we're going to start with what happens uh, in normal patients. There is relative hypoventilation. That means you tend to take a shallower breath when you sleep. There is slight decrease in hypoxic and hypercarbic respiratory drive to breathe. Hence, it leads to a reduction in your tidal volume by 25%. For example, if somebody is breathing at a tidal volume of 500 ml, their tidal volume decreases by 25% when they sleep. Their partial pressure of oxygen in the blood goes down very minimally by about 3 to 5 millimeters and the carbon dioxide rises by about 3 to 6 millimeters of mercury. And hence, the pH of the blood is maintained with this change in PCO2. These changes are exemplified or attenuated in REM sleep. However, even though there is a drop in tidal volume and PAO2, there is no significant change in your saturation. If you look at the diagram, which is an oxygen dissociation curve, where partial pressure of oxygen is plotted against the oxygen saturation, you can see that on the flatter top part of the curve, a drop in your partial pressure of oxygen, the saturation doesn't change much. And now what happens in the neuromuscular disease patients? These so-called normal changes in respiration during sleep become much more exemplified, leads to fry hypoventilation they tend to take a much shallower respiration, tend to rebreathe their own carbon dioxide and unable to increase their ventilation. Hence, their carbon dioxide increases further and there may be a further drop in saturation because the drop in tidal volume is much more remarkable. So now let's talk about the impact of disordered breathing during sleep. So what happens to sleep if somebody is not breathing properly when they are sleeping? that leads to a lot of sleep disturbance, typically micro and macro arousals. There can be even frank awakenings. Ultimately, this leads to significant sleep fragmentation. There is reduced in the amount of REM sleep. A child has about 30 to 50% of the REM sleep depending on what age. An infant tends to have about 50% and adults tend to have about 20 to 25%. And REM sleep is very important for your memory, consolidation and the neuronal pruning and development. Hence, your REM sleep tends to go down. There is further worsening of your gas exchange and respiratory events during REM sleep. So your upper airway, which tends to lose tone during REM sleep, has increased tendency to collapse. Your functional residual capacity, which is FRC, tends to go down. Hence, your oxygen reserve in the lung goes down and your respiratory drive is variable, hence you have a varying degree of tidal volume during your REM sleep. Because of these changes, you have significant daytime symptoms like fatigue, tiredness, sleepiness, morning headaches, poor memory recall, or learning difficulties, and shortness of breath. So before we talk about how we're gonna treat different sleep disorder breathing, let's overview what does the spectrum of sleep disorder breathing in children entails. The most common ones are the obstructive sleep apnea, which is a spectrum of disorder breathing due to airway obstruction, can range from primary or habitual snoring, 
which means a patient snores but doesn't have a classic obstructive sleep apnea. Two, an upper airway resistance syndrome also called as UARS. This is a slightly more severe degree from a snoring perspective. They have a flow limitation, but this causes significant sleep fragmentation. And then your frank obstructive sleep apnea where airway completely collapses. Coming from obstructive, moving to central sleep apnea. So it entails your classic central sleep apnea because of various neurological issues like Chieri malformation, central hypoventilation, such as seen in neuromuscular disorders, or periodic breathing as seen in some of the newborn and premature babies. Sometimes this pattern can coexist, giving rise to a mixed pattern of sleep disorder breathing. So other type of sleep disorder breathing include sleep tachypnea, that somebody is breathing faster than typical during sleep as seen in patients who are morbidly obese or in patients who have restrictive lung disease. Sleep hypoxemia, particularly in children with underlying lung disease, severe asthma, chronic lung disease, or cystic fibrosis. These patients have a normal saturation while awake, but as soon as they fall asleep, they develop hypoxemia. These patients may need treatment with oxygen. Sleep hypoventilation. These patients have normal carbon dioxide and saturation while awake, but during sleep, their CO2 tends to go up and typically about 50 for more than 20% of the time during sleep. Complex sleep apnea, these patients who develop central sleep apnea after treatment of their obstructive sleep apnea. There are various dysregulated breathing during sleep as seen in patients with Joubert syndrome, Rett syndrome, and in situations like Biot's breathing, erratic respiration in some of the neurological disorders and diaphragmatic flutter where they can have ineffective ventilation and leads to sleep fragmentation and gas exchange abnormalities. So this is a diagram of an upper airway. I think we need to understand that and this will help us to understand how the positive pressure therapy works. So here we are seeing uh, a diagram <coughs> of a sagittal view of your larynx and upper airway. It involves the nasopharynx, the soft palate, the velum, there is a tongue over there, and there is a retroglossal space. The space behind the tongue is the airway which is, has highest propensity to collapse and cause obstructive sleep apnea. And below that, there is epiglottis. If the tongue falls back, it pushes the epiglottis and completely closes your laryngeal inlet, leading to frank apneas. So, the other important concept to understand in children whenever we treat sleep apnea is a concept called P-crit or a critical closing pressure. I'm going to just simplify and use few words to describe this. A critical closing pressure is the pressure at which your airway or upper airway collapses. Typically, it needs a significant amount of negative pressure which leads to collapse of the airway. Now, in this diagram, you see the first graph which shows the critical pressure of infants and then compares to children and adults. On this graph, you will see an x-axis and y-axis. On x-axis, you see the pressure required for the airway to collapse starting from 0 and goes all the way to minus 40. And on the y-axis, you see the maximum inspiratory flow per second. Interestingly, Infants have the least collapsible airways compared to children and adults. Infants require much negative pressure, up to minus 30 centimeters of water for the airway to collapse. The more negative the pressure, the more stable the airway. The less negative the pressure or more positive the pressure, the more unstable the airway. Hence, obstructive sleep apnea in a typically healthy infant is very rare. While you see that in adults, they require less negative pressure. As much as minus 10 to 12 centimeters of water can collapse the airway. And this can be generated during sleep. And hence, adults have higher risk of developing sleep apnea. And that can depend on your muscle tone, upper airway muscle tone, particularly genoglossus, and also your body habitus. And now, this is a sleep study of a child who has sleep apnea. You can listen to the audio and you can see a clear snoring and the events mark 
with the blue bars are the ones which are obstructive hypopneas, where the patient has a respiratory effort, but the flow is reduced, and then there is a sudden gasp of air, which are recovery breaths, and then the patient goes back and sleeps further and develops this recurrent cyclical obstructive sleep apnea. And this is a drug-induced sleep endoscopy in a child who had severe sleep apnea. If you look at this video, you can see that there is a significant lateral collapse and you can see the fluttering of the lateral pharyngeal wall which is consistent with snoring in this child. So this child had tonsils removed for, I don't know, for sleep apnea, but the patient had persistent sleep apnea. So when we did a drug into sleep endoscopy is a procedure where you give light sedation to the patient just to induce sleep so it can mimic the natural sleep without losing the complete upper airway refluxes but the patient is sleeping and breathing on his own without any respiratory support. We put a scope in the nasopharynx and point towards <coughs> the laryngeal inlet and see how the airways behave. In this video you can clearly see there is a lateral wall collapse. So now, understanding the video, it is a cartoon of the upper airway diagram and shows how a positive airway pressure therapy helps the airways. It's basically stenting. It's a pneumatic stent which stabilizes the airway. First, it causes pharyngeal unfolding. It reduces the compliance of the upper airway, decompresses the airway, it opens the airway, and also causes hiatal retraction and stabilize the airway. So combination of these things leads to stabilization of the upper airway so that the airway is patent, it doesn't collapse, and you can breathe through those airways. So what is the goal of a positive pressure therapy? First, to improve the symptoms. If somebody is symptomatic because of the disordered breathing during sleep, you want to help them. Then you want to treat the upper airway obstruction. That means if you are doing a sleep study, you want to make sure that their obstructive sleep apnea index is less than one per hour. This can be done by using positive pressure which stands open the airway and stabilizes the larynx as we discussed in our previous slide. The apnea hypopnea index, also called as AHI, is the marker of the severity of obstructive sleep apnea. It is the total number of obstruct events divided by the total duration of sleep. The next goal is to improve the gas exchange. This happens by increasing the FRC. By giving a positive pressure, you recruit the alveoli, you open up the lung, and there is a better residual capacity. Hence, there is better ventilation. You enhance the tidal volume. Your carbon dioxide goes down. The goal is to bring it below 45. And the goal of saturation is to keep it above 96. It also reduces the work of breathing and respiratory muscle fatigue. So you're augmenting the respiration by a positive pressure. So the, the, the body has to work harder when you have an obstructive airway because it is fighting the resistance of the airway collapse. When you prevent the upper airway collapse, when the airway is patent, the respiratory mechanics are more efficient and the it reduces the work of breathing. It improves the sleep quality. We learned in the previous slide that a disordered breathing can cause significant sleep fragmentation. And because of the poor sleep they get, they tend to have a significant daytime symptoms. And hence, by giving them a stable airway, stable respiration, you can stabilize their sleep 
and hence you can treat their daytime symptoms of sleepiness, tiredness and fatigue. And it also improves your cardiac function. <clears throat> and if somebody is stressed out because they are having poor sleep, because of poor breathing, that increases your sympathetic drive, you tend to be more stressed out and it also reduces your sympathetic drive. Hence, patients who are treated with positive pressure therapy for obstructive sleep apnea tend to have a, a better a sympathetic tone. Hence, their blood pressure and other things tend to be much more normal range. CPAP. Now, let's start with continuous positive pressure ventilation. So, what are the indications or clinical indications for using CPAP in children? The most common indications are obstructive sleep apnea. Typically, in a child has severe obstructive sleep apnea, we use this as a bridge therapy until a positive uh, intervention or a more definitive intervention such as surgery is done. Or sometimes we use CPAP when there is no surgically treatable lesion for that patient. A residual sleep apnea. A child who had sleep apnea underwent procedure like adenotonsillectomy. In spite of that, there is a significant residual sleep apnea. We use CPAP, which is considered the second line of therapy after surgery. In some children's even though there is a surgically correctable lesion, the surgery is contraindicated. Either the patient is unstable or there is some disorder which prevents the patient getting anesthesia. So then the CPAP becomes the primary treatment for them. Or in extreme, some of the situations where parents refuse a surgery, we use CPAP for treatment of sleep apnea. Central sleep apnea like and periodic breathing are other indications for using CPAP, but, but we typically don't use in the very severe central sleep apnea. If there are some milder degree of central sleep apnea, by improving the FRC, they can improve the oxygen reserve, which improves oxygenation, and hence you can treat the central sleep apnea. Mixed sleep apnea. So, so these patients are predominantly obstructive in nature. Because of the recurrent obstructive cycling, they can get post-arousal centrals. So by treating obstruction by CPAP, you can treat the centrals because you stabilize the sleep. In some situations, post-extubation, after a suspected patient with OSA, you want to give him temporarily. And in some patients who are very tachypnic and who has increased work of breathing, you use CPAP as a temporizing measure to improve the FRC and reduce the work of breathing. And sometimes in patients with extreme trichomalacia, where the airway is completely collapsing during expiration, you want to give him a positive pressure to keep open the trachea for better pulmonary clearance and also delivery of the medicines. So these are some of the challenges we encounter when we write about CPAP prescription. In children, for OSA, although there are no clear-cut guidelines, but an AHI of 1 to 1.5, which is considered abnormal, may be an indication to cover the CPAP from an insurance perspective compared to adults. The adults need to have an AHI of at least 5 with symptoms or 15 per hour without symptoms for an insurance company to cover for the CPAP. The insurance typically needs a documentation of the OSA on a PSG, so you invariably end up doing a sleep study, in-lab sleep study for children and a home-based sleep study for adults. And then if you're using CPAP, they will also want to know, did you do a titration study? What pressure worked? So they want to see that you actually did a study that the CPAP was effective and efficacious, hence they can cover it. So these are the things you need to keep in mind while ordering for CPAP. So what are the type of CPAP therapies? Up until now, and, and mostly in children, we use a single setting CPAP, like CPAP of five centimeters of water, and, and the patient is on five centimeters of water, irrespective of what stage of sleep the patient is in, or 10 centimeters of water. That is called single pressure setting. Then the next one is auto CPAP. You typically what you do is you put a range for the machine, like four to 15 centimeters of water. So these are the smart machines which can sense the patient's flow or an impending obstruction or snoring and automatically adjust the pressure. So when the patient is falling asleep, it is at the lowest pressure. And as soon as the patient goes into deeper sleep and even in REM sleep, when the obstruction increase, the pressure automatically increases to the point the obstructions are taken care. And when the patient is in different stages of sleep, which may require a different pressure, 
the pressure comes down. So it, it is much more friendly with the patient's breathing effort. And typically we have used this in some of the older and teenage patients. And CPAP with C-Flex or uh, C-Flex Plus, these are some of the mechanisms like expiratory pressure relief. For example, when you apply CPAP 10 to 15, it's pretty high pressure for a child. So you're breathing in with that pressure of 10 centimeters and you're breathing out against 10 centimeters. And sometimes it can be very uncomfortable. By using this pressure relief, the companies have come up with an algorithm a relief of one, two, and three doesn't necessarily correlate with the degree of centimeters of water pressure, but it does drop your expiratory pressure to a certain extent. If it was 10, maybe like eight or seven, so that your breathing is much more smoother and against less resistance. And there are other modes we typically don't use in older children. It has been used and tried in neonates and infants in the NICU. These are bubble CPAP, and sometimes you can use a high flow nasal cannula such as RAM cannula to deliver the flow. When the high flow is given at a little bit higher rate, it does deliver some degree of positive pressure and it does act like a CPAP. So what are the common settings one uses for CPAP? The minimum settings are four and five. In our sleep lab, we start at five centimeters of water and titrate upwards. What is an optimum setting for CPAP? A setting is considered optimum, ideally, when it eliminates all the snoring, the flow limitations, and all the obstructive events, including in supine REM sleep, when your obstruction tends to be worse, and also improves your gas exchange. If you're doing a sleep study, your AHI, which is an apnea hypopnea index, should be less than one. That is optimum and ideal. So what is the maximum setting one can use? Typically in a child who is less than 12 years old, we go up to 15 centimeters of water. In a child more than 12, we can go up to 20 centimeters of water. But by this time, it becomes very uncomfortable. We may consider switching them to a bi-level ventilation. What are the practical considerations of ordering a CPAP study? So we get asked multiple times that, what are the things I need to worry about or, or take into consideration into an order when I order a CPAP study? The in-lab titration study to identify the appropriate pressure for a child is the gold standard. During titration, we start with the low lowest pressure and see how the child does. If there are obstruction on top of that pressure, we increase the pressure by one centimeter. We wait for about five minutes for the breathing to acclimatize and stabilize on that pressure. For a child less than 12, any apnea indicating that the airway is completely collapsing, meaning the pressure is ineffective, we increase the pressure up until you completely resolve the apneas. Then, if there are hypopneas, and hypopnea is a respiratory event where the airway collapses, but it does not completely close, or some milder respiratory events or some ambiguous events. So the goal is to eliminate all this obstruction and also the snoring. In, in a child more than 12 years of age, you use two apneas, and similarly, goal is to eliminate all the obstruction. The airflow during the CPAP titration study is measured by internal sensor called C-flow. We need to have good carbon dioxide signals when the child doesn't tolerate nasal cannula, we use transcutaneous monitors. We need to have a good saturation probes and, and signals. We have a snore microphone to make sure that the snoring is eliminated and we have a good respiratory effort belts to see the effort. And the scoring parameters are same as we use for a diagnostic study. This is the CPAP prescription, and these are some of the salient features you would like to add in a CPAP script so the insurance company can dispose the right machine with the right setting. First, you would like to talk about the indication, like obstructive sleep apnea, you would like to write out the goal of the therapy to, is to treat obstructive sleep apnea. Duration of the therapy, invariably, we tend to write it as lifetime, but if you are planning to write for a short term, you can write six months or a year. Instructions, we usually write to use the device during sleep or naps, depending on the age. If you would like to write the details of the machine, you can write the type and the make of the machine. 
Then the most important thing is the pressure settings. You can write a standard setting at 10 or 12 centimeters of water or an auto CPAP. You write a range of the pressures, meaning from 5 to 15 centimeters of water. Pressure relief, you may write required or not. If yes, you can write the setting of 1, 2 or 3. You write the mask, the type of the mask, nasal or full face. About the humidification, you'd like it or not. And then if you write humidification, you write the level of humidification. If you want to set a ramp for the pressure to rise, you can write between 15 to 20 minutes. The tubing types, regular or heated tubings. Most of the time, if available, we use heated tubings to avoid condensation of the tube. And then you write the refills for the mask and the tubings, which are typically supplied between three to six months. BiPAP. Now coming from a, a CPAP to bi-level positive pressure therapy or also called as BiPAP therapy. So what is the difference between bi-level and CPAP? In bi-level, there are two settings. In CPAP, there is only one. It's a continuous one pressure setting. In a bi-level, as the name suggests, there are two pressures. There is an expiratory positive airway pressure, which is similar to your CPAP, and inspiratory positive airway pressure, which only is delivered when you breathe in. So there are sensors in this, which senses your inspiratory effort at the beginning of the inspiration and delivers the pressure, which is your IPAP. And hence, it tends to synchronize with your respiration. It improves, similar to CPAP, upper airway patency and also in addition to uh, improving your upper airway patency it augments your tidal volume it delivers a bigger breath which is the most important feature of a bi-level ventilation compared to CPAP which typically does not augment your tidal volume and hence it is extremely useful in patients with restricted lung disease and neuromuscular disorders who tend to take a much shallower respiration this provides non-invasive positive pressure ventilation particularly in children with central sleep apnea or extremely shallow respiration where they are not able to generate enough tidal volume, you can put them on a backup rate, whatever rate depending on the age of the patient and can maintain their minute ventilation. As you know, the minute ventilation depends on respiratory rate and tidal volume. You can change and play with this by either increasing the respiratory rate or changing the tidal volume by increasing your IPAP. So what is the rationale for using bi-level positive pressure ventilation. One, upper airway collapsibility does not occur only during inspiration, but also during expiration. Your EPAP acts like CPAP and stands open the airway. So at the end of inspiration, the airway is sufficiently patent to generate inspiration and trigger your IPAP. If your airway completely collapsed, you may not be able to trigger your BiPAP or bi-level ventilation. What are the different modes of bi-level therapy? The bi-level therapy can be spontaneous mode, which it just tangos with the patient's respiration. It can be spontaneous and timed mode. You can put a particular time, it can deliver the rate. It can be an auto mode, or you can also set a, a volume, a tidal volume targeted mode. So it delivers a particular tidal rather than a pressure. The previous modes I discussed with the all pressure based the volume-based one will assure you that it delivers certain volume and automatically adjust the pressure. The pressure mode, the pressure is stable, the volume changes. So again, these are the two things, the spontaneous mode, the time mode, we talked about it, and you can also control your inspiratory time. So regarding how to use bi-level therapy, first you have to understand what you're treating. If you are using bi-level to treat obstructive sleep apnea alone because the pressure on the CPAP are so high, then you just need a bi-level spontaneous mode. You don't need an ST mode. If you are using a bi-level therapy in a patient who has central sleep apnea and needs a backup rate when the patient becomes completely apneic, you need to use bi-level ST mode because it can give a backup rate. Then, Based on the titration study, you can identify what was the IPAP and what was the EPAP. If you want to augment your tidal volume, it is important that you keep enough an IE difference or the delta. I typically try to keep a delta of 6 or higher for 
augmenting your tidal volume in patients with hyperventilation. But for patients with OSA, at least four and above should be okay. The difference between IPAP and EPAP is considered pressure support. For example, if somebody has is an uh, IPAP of 12 and EPAP of 6, the pressure support would be 6. That means 6 above the EPAP. Then you use the backup rate depending on the patient's age. We try to keep the backup rate as close to the normal resting sleep respiratory rate for that patient at that age. Most of the children who are 2 years and above tend to have a respiratory rate less than 20. So we may keep a respiratory rate between 15 to 20 or sometimes higher depending on the situation. So this is an example of how we write. We start with an IPAP of 8 or 4, IE difference of 4 and above. Then you want to keep the maximum difference you want to maintain. If you want to maintain the maximum difference of 10, you have to write in your prescription during titration study. And the typical maximum IPAP we use is 30 and the maximum EPAP we use 20. And beyond that, there is a chances that you may cause more trouble and becomes very uncomfortable for the patient or the child to use it. And the respiratory rate can vary from 8 to 30, depending on the clinical situation. So what are the conditions where you need to use a backup rate? As I mentioned before, somebody with a central sleep apnea, or sometimes they may not have a, a many central sleep apnea, but intermittently they are having this prolonged sleep apnea. Somebody having bradypnea, that means the respiratory rate during sleep is about three to four breaths per minute. So those are the patients you need to use a backup rate. In patients with neuromuscular weakness, they are just so tachypneic, they're taking such a shallow respiration, they are ineffective in ventilating. In that situation, giving them a backup rate, they tend to ride the ventilator and tend to maintain their gas exchange. If somebody with a restrictive lung component, a backup rate may, may also be not a bad idea because the, the, the effort, the inspiratory effort may be so shallow that it may not trigger a BiPAP. Patient with obesity related hypoventilation, extremely morbidly obese, tend to be tachypneic during sleep and also tend to take a very shallow respiration. So a backup rate may be helpful. And also conditions such as complex sleep apnea, which is a mixture of both central and obstruction. And typically sometimes the, the centrals may appear after treating the obstruction. When adequate ventilation and muscle rest is not obtained with the maximum pressure support, sometimes when you're when you're just keeping on increasing your pressure support, you're still not be able to get a, a good uh, <coughs> uh, uh, ventilation. You may consider adding a backup rate. Inspiratory time we typically keep between 1.2 to 1.6 second. Depending on the respiratory rate you choose, the inspiratory time can vary. So percentage of IPAP time is about 30 to 40 percent. 30% of IPAP time in obstructive lung disease and 40% of the IPAP time for inspector time in chest wall diseases. So next, we're going to talk about the indication of use of oxygen during non positive pressure ventilation. Typically, when somebody's awake saturation is less than 88 on room air, those patients invariably need oxygen both awake and during sleep. But during a CPAP titration study, when the pressure support and the respiratory rate has been optimized and you have eliminated all the obstructive and central events, but the patient saturation is less than 90% for about five minutes or more, or it is less than 88% persistent for more than two minutes, we will consider adding oxygen. The idea of adding oxygen is to improve the FiO2 and increase their oxygenation and hence oxygen saturation, while your positive pressure ventilation has failed to improve oxygenation in spite of optimizing the respiration. We start with a minimum oxygen flow at 0.25 liters per minute, and we titrate in 0.25 liters per minute increments to maintain the saturation about 94 to 96% as requested by the ordering provider. What are the timings to follow up titration sleep studies? That depends on the underlying conditions and what you're treating. So once somebody starts, if somebody gains significant weight, you have a patient, you started on CPAP of say five centimeters of water, the patient comes back after one or two years doing well, and you see that the patient has gained about 20 pounds or 25 pounds, and now either struggling to use CPAP or is snoring while on CPAP, indicating that he may need more pressure. In that situation, you may need to do. 
in younger children like infants who tend to typically outgrow if they don't have any other uh, craniofacial abnormalities you want to repeat it at a sooner date between 3 to 6 months to make sure that underlying respiration has stabilized so you can discontinue the positive pressure ventilation or you see that the patient this is progresses from a neuromuscular standpoint you may have to do a retitration to optimize the gas exchange and not only the gas exchange to make sure that the sleep is stabilized on the positive pressure ventilation hence the sleep study is very useful if somebody is using but his sleepiness and tiredness and other symptoms of sleep apnea recur while they are using in addition to checking the compliance to make sure that they are actually using before you bring this patient back to the titration to see that what's going on and after surgery or the patient undergoes a surgical intervention while on cpap you want to repeat 4 to 6 weeks after surgery to make sure the underlying sleep apnea has resolved so you can stop the therapy for the bipap prescription you would like to write the indication the goal of the therapy if you're writing for hypoventilation is to correct carbon dioxide if the duration of the therapy is required you typically write lifetime or the duration you intend to use instruction is to use during sleep or naps again machine make model the settings are important depending on what mode you use if you use st mode you would like to write a rate if it is a spontaneous mode you can just write the inspiratory positive airway pressure which is ipap and then epap we typically keep the delta between 4 to 6 the backup rate if required you write rates per minute inspiratory time can be written based on your indication then you go for pressure relief mask type humidification similar to the cpap we discussed and then mask refills and tubings so this is a cartoon which shows based on the different modes of cpap and bipap and underlying conditions you can use this in various uh, respiratory situations other points to address sometimes in addition to treating you're treating not only the respiration during sleep you're also treating the sleep you may need some adjuvant medications to help them to tolerate reduce the anxiety mostly in adults in some teenagers we may use melatonin to help them we work with the sleep schedule modification so that the sleep hygiene is optimized sometimes the third party payers they want to see that the patient is actually using the machine if they don't use the machine for more than 3 months the insurance companies may take away the machine in that situation you may need to repeat another sleep study and then give them the cpap it turns out to be very expensive hence to make your patient understand all this and it is it's important that you discuss these things very carefully in the beginning it's a glass half full approach i would accept somebody tolerating few hours rather than aiming for 8 hours from day 1 as they follow up with you and you work with them with various aspects of sleep breathing machine and the mask you may be achieve the full glass of compliance and success of therapy so this is a compliance report you can see that based on the particular date for this patient this is each bar indicates that the patient was using cpap and what was the duration of the usage and it gives you a graph like that out of the range of days for example in this situation 129 days days with device used was 129 days and the days without the device was 0 days hence the compliance was 100% and you can also see the average usage is about 4 hours to 46 minutes in this patient and it also gives you um the maximum pressure used it also gives you the leak and also gives you the residual ahi that means in spite of this patient being on pressure of 8 cm of water you can see at the bottom that the ahi which was still 3 per hour and and that may be acceptable for an older child um uh, adolescent and adults and for a younger child you may have to relook either by increasing the pressure so that you can eliminate these residual obstructions types of masks there are various masks used for children and recently there has been so many masks in the market it is very important to for us to be familiar there are only few masks which are used for infants such as respironic wisp pediatrics small nasal mask and mini me too sometimes we use a bubble cpap mask and people sometimes use 
a thick nasal cannula such as ram cannula. In children, there are several masks available and teenagers, we use the smaller version or the medium version of the adult masks. This is your Respironics Wisp Pediatric Nasal Mask. It comes with a three size mask in a packet. One is for the infants, one is for the child, small children and one is for the teenagers. And this is a fancier mask which is very child friendly and only a nasal mask. It has a Velcro adjusting headgear. These are the other masks which are produced by another company called Resmed. These are Pixie Pediatric Nasal Masks. These are various masks mentioned here with the appropriate headgear. Headgear is a very integral and important part of the CPAP interface. If you don't select a right headgear, the mask may be loose and may come off or if it is too tight, it may cause sores. These are also some of the different masks we use in pediatrics such as Noni Pediatric Nasal Mask. So thank you very much for listening to me. Um, I hope uh, I will try to address some of the issues and some of the modes of ventilations. And if you have any questions, um, uh, please send it to me. Thank you. Please help us improve the content by providing us with some feedback.